Just in terms of rates here, let's break this up with a, a few numbers, a few factoids. You know, kids with autism are, for, are at much greater risk of, of developing mental health issues than the general population is, um, whether it's through parent surveys or teacher surveys or self-reports, questionnaires, or psychiatric interviewing. Even when they go through, go through great pains at, at breaking apart kind of what is autism symptoms and what's not. Mazevsky did a great job. Carla Mazevsky did a, a great job at this. Um, at kind of breaking apart the two. Originally, they said it was around 70%. It's actually probably less than that, but it's still much higher than in the general population. That is, often, if you did, like, are people here familiar with the anxiety disorder interview schedule? Some people are. I, I use that often in our research. It's often used in research of CBT trials in autism. And it can be a very useful measure, a very useful interview schedule, because it, it helps. Why? Because it helps to structure things Right, when things are quite emotional, it helps, it helps to keep things going where you can use it as a, listen, I just have to ask you about these questions. Right? I, I know you, let's just put up that on the parking lot and let's keep going. Right? Or just tell me yes or no to these. I know a lot of them are gonna be no, this is irrelevant, but let me just read off, because I have to. See, it's in bold, I have to read what's in bold. Right? I'm not allowed to, okay, let's, so it helps to structure what could be a very emotional experience. But at the same time, if you don't use your clinical judgment, if you just read that and followed that, kids are gonna look, you're gonna be taking sometimes everything off because of the child's intellectual functioning, because of the child's issues with adaptive behavior or adaptive independent skills, or because of the child's ASD, or all, you know, symptom profile. Uh, so, so you have to use it judiciously. So, you know, um, Mazewski did just that at, at taking the time to differentiate the two and say, well, give, constantly asking, can you give me an example of that? And then if you know autism, you're thinking, well, that's a really good example of autism, right? So, oh, that, that seems like more. And, then, and the difference, always going back to, have, has Billy always been like this ever since he was two years old, three years old? Is this something new? When did it, ha when did it start? Right, these kinds of questions of how have things changed from baseline. That's not in the ATIS. Um, it's in, there's other schedules for adults, the PDD, I, I can email you. There's a bunch of other ones that actually ask that question explicitly. But you don't need a questionnaire to tell you to do that if you just, because you're here, right? Just do that, kind of constantly go back and forth. But when they do that, it's about 50, still 50% or so. How about here in BC? So this is part of a survey we did a long time ago, just to, just, just to break things up, where we, this is part of the National Needs Assessment Survey. So we um, asked, this is, a care, this is through Caregiver Report and through the self-advocates here in BC. We asked them, uh, do you currently have concerns with, not do you have a psychiatric diagnosis of, uh, so this could be associated with their anxiety. These are the kind of, what, what are your current level concerns? And so you see here for preschoolers, the parents of preschoolers, in terms of the degree of concerns they have around anxiety, almost at 50%. Depression, not really a concern for that age group. And then you see this kind of 20 to 30% around self-injury, destruction of properties, and so on. And no, no law issues, thankfully, with preschoolers, <laughs> right? Uh, the parents of school-age youth, so you can see the, the rise. And I think this is actually quite, quite accurate. I mean, this is what I experience if, you go, if I go into a school. Um, with the higher current concerns around anxiety for their youth, depression starts to pop up, typically same age, same kind of uh, age range as you would expect, pre-adolescence pre and adolescence, right, becomes this major kind of area for depression, right, with higher issues around anxiety, anger, because, you know, as we get bigger, that manifestation of anger becomes far more disruptive to the self and to others. Right? Um, the same thing for adults caregivers' concerns around adults. We see a little blip in terms of problems with the law now um, and lower kind of concerns around hurting others, right? But the same, same stable issues around anger, uh, higher levels of depression. And this is the self-advocates, the adults with autism who report about concerns about that they have for themselves. I thought that was interesting to kind of uh, take a look at. And then when we asked about how, looked at the number of concerns they endorsed, right? Oh, you have this in your slides. Right, so I don't have to point to them. So you can see the, the number who didn't have any of those concerns, the numbers who had one, but the substantial group that had three or more of those concerns, and how that three or more group increases with age for the, um, for the uh, school age, and then it actually goes down for the, uh, the adults. Right? But it's not that there's zero concerns or just one. Many people have two concerns or three or more, and that's for the self-advocates. 
So you can see that this is shared, but I think the, the people that often come to me are the people who are, who are here, right? This is the, the age, not the, certainly not the zeros, right? Uh, but also not even those who often have just one concern. There's this really, I always share this transactional model that Jeffrey Wood kind of came out with a few years ago now because I think it is an important ASD specific lens to how we conceptualize their mental health issues. So you can think about the dynamics. Remember, so the four Ps has, is not explanatory at all. The four Ps is just a set of organizing principles, right? It just helps you to literally organize into some cells. But the explanatory piece are the arrows, is how do these things interact with each other? So this kind of model suggests is a transactional model, and it says that people with autism have ASD-related stressors. So you can imagine, look in that first bo box, think about the Ps, this is where a whole bunch of those Ps go, right? So a whole bunch of the Ps might be around social confusion, it might be issues with not being able to read, so ASD-related stressors. There might be social confusion ones, or, um, or not being able to read social situations well, peer rejection and bullying that we know, so which might be a precipitating factor, a maintaining factor, right? Being prevented from engaging in pleasurable activities is a key component that's rather ASD specific, right? In the sense that, uh, imagine what it's like to go every day with not being able to engage in the one thing that you really have an urge to engage in, right? That's pleasurable for you. I wanna talk about plumbing right now, but I can't because I'm in math class. Right? That's just life. You, you can't always engage in the things you want to engage in. You can't always do that. You're being withheld from doing that. That's part of living within a broader uh, non-ASD world. But it doesn't mean those things are going to be easy for you. It's, these are not just more ASD related. Day-to-day -day stressors, these small things, these aren't acute stressors. And lastly, uh, aversive sensory experiences. So you have these kind of clusters of you can organize them in this way, and then look to see how those things might relate to whether it's social anxiety, where the more socially content areas of their stressors might be associated with social anxiety, right, like an unpredictable social environment, um, or just more negative affectivity in general, whether it's just anxiety, anger, depression, negative content to the emotional state. Right? That the more ASD-related stressors you experience on a day-to-day -day basis, the more likely it is you're going to kind of have that experience, which then will lead to uh, some consequences, which will lead to kind of increased social avoidance if it's social anxiety, or increased ASD symptomatology. We see this kind of loop that happens where as people become more anxious, or more depressed or more angry, there's a greater tendency to perseverate. There's a, a, a greater challenge with functioning in that social world, demonstrating the social skills that they do have. Because the, the, a lot of times when somebody's living in a rule-based way where they're walking around saying, okay, he just made eye contact with me. This is the point where I'm supposed to make eye contact back, but don't make eye contact for too long, right? So when I'm flirting, I, I should wait for them to say something first, right? All of those kind of social skills instructions that we give people for years and years and years and years about ways that they should change themselves or ways that they could be better socially. A lot of that is always rule-based. You're constantly thinking. So if you're feeling these high emotions, a lot of that's going to go fall to the wayside because those are voluntary acts, right? And when you're in an emotionally driven state, those voluntary acts are the first things to go. And you go back to your involuntary nature. So you can see a decompensation, a, a breakdown, a greater ASD symptomatology as a result. And essentially, around and around we go. With these greater ASD symptomatology, these ASD symptoms, we get greater ASD-related stressors. Right? So we have this loop. So this is an example of a bunch of arrows with some direction for you. Right? So pick, pick this as you, as you may, but I find this very useful. When I'm talking with somebody in, in session and I'm learning from them, I often can see what those ASD-related stressors are for that person, and I can see how that's related to their emotions, but also how those emotions then feed back in this way. 